Great. Well, if you've, uh, <coughs> if you've got your Bibles with you, I'd like to turn with me to the book of Mark. The book of Mark will be continuing on. Mark chapter 15. We'll read from, um, we'll go from verse, we'll go from verse 16 and we'll read through to verse 41. So Mark chapter 15, verse 16 uh, through to 41. Says, then the soldiers led Jesus away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison, and they clothed him with purple. They twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed, and spat on him, and bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to 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 bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroyed the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests, also mocking among among themselves with the scribes, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is is translated, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, Leave him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the less, and of Joseph, and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in, when he was in Galilee and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Well, there lies the reading of our words uh, this morning, our text together. Let's just pray, shall we, as we consider the message this morning. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we just pray that you'd help us this morning, help me, Lord, to uh, think clearly, to 
to preach, Lord, with unction and liberty. Pray that you'd give me clarity of thought and speech, Lord, with regards to this message. Lord, we, we think of the infinite mystery in many ways of the substitutionary work of Christ. Father, it's, a, it's an infinite work. Our finite mi minds struggle to even comprehend the depth and the magnitude of the cross. Lord, but I pray that you'd speak to us now. Lord, that you'd work in our hearts and our minds. We pray for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. When you look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we see, as we've, as we've journeyed through, through Mark specifically, we've seen the Lord often sharing with the disciples about this crucifixion that's going to be taking place, this, this work of Calvary, this death, this burial, this resurrection. We see this now coming into its fulfillment. We see this now actually taking place uh, before their very eyes. When you consider the Gospels, even themselves, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we see, uh, we hear about Jesus' birth. It doesn't give us too much information about his young life. We know about when he was found in the temple as a young boy and so on. And then we see the Gospels really explode with Jesus' ministry at the age of 30 years old. He enters into his public ministry. And we see the chapters go by in the, in, in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But as we approach the, the final moments of Jesus' life, we approach the... The, uh, the Last Supper, so to speak, as we've looked at him instituting the Lord's Supper. Um, we see the, the trial, the betrayal, the arrest, and we see a, a real weight of gravity within the text given to the crucifixion of Christ. We see it within all four of the Gospels. It's, a, it's, the, it's the center, it's the citadel of the Christian faith. It's the apex of what God wants to show us. There's so much uh, for us in here, for us to see. God is, God is designing the word in such a way that the crucifixion is, is central to its importance. There's, a, there's, a, there's so much uh, narrative surrounding uh, what took place upon that cross. And we have reached our point now in Mark, the series through Mark, where we come to the crucifixion of Christ. The crucifixion of Christ. And I want to just consider this reality of Christ's crucifixion this morning. It's not something that we take lightly. It's the central theme of the Christian faith. It's what saves a person. As I've already just shared, there's an infinite magnitude and mystery of what took place upon that cross. It's not easy even for a preacher to even preach about the substitutionary work of Christ because of the depth that's involved and the price that was paid uh, by the Lord of glory. But there's some things I want to consider. I've got this idea of the, um, the five D's of the crucifixion. The five D's of the crucifixion. And the first D that I'd like to consider this morning is the, the depravity of his crucifixion. Now when I say that, I'm obviously not talking about uh, the depravity of Christ in any way. We know that he is perfect. We know that this work is perfect. We know that God has ordained this perfect work. But the depravity of his crucifiers, those who were involved in crucifying him, the depravity of those who were uh, connected to this crucifixion. Now, we've, we've spoken in weeks gone by uh, of men such as Caiaphas, the high priest, uh, of Pilate, Pontius Pilate, of others that were involved. But I want us just to, in this first D of the crucifixion, consider... Uh, some of the positions of the, the individuals involved with the crucifixion. We see, we see firstly, um, the indifference of man. The indifference of man. Verse 24 of our text, And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. You see this picture here of those uh, who were involved in the crucifixion, maybe soldiers, maybe something they did often. If it's clothing that couldn't be shared out, They've got to cast lots for it. We've got to, we've got to just um, uh, gamble for this clothing. And uh, that's what they were doing here. There was, a, there was an everyday at the office type of attitude here for some of these individuals involved, some of the executioners, some of the soldiers uh, around the crucifixion of Christ, showing a real indifference, uh, almost effectively saying that this, this saviour, this, this man Jesus of Nazareth, he has no bearing upon our lives. This is another day for us. We're just here. We're doing what we always do. This death has nothing to do with us. 
You know, if these men didn't repent, if these men didn't come to Christ before their deaths, how wrong they would be. Their indifference would be ultimately what damns their souls for all eternity to hell. And you see, many, many men and women in the world today have an indifference about the things of Christ. You can speak to someone and it's like water off a duck's back. Well, yeah, Jesus died on a cross and I know there was a man called Jesus, but there's an indifference. It's not that they're actively railing uh, in, a, in, a fo- in, in a manifest sense at the forefront of their very being towards God and towards Christ, but there's an indifference. So I'm just getting on with my life. I'm just doing what I want to do, just walking through life. If you don't mind, I'm just going to open these curtains so I can see my... It's a bit, bit brighter. So we see this indifference of man. Secondly, we see blasphemers. Look in our text today, verse 29. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Some people like to say that actually the opposition towards Christ, it wasn't the Jewish crowds as such, it wasn't the Jewish people at that particular point in time, it was just the Sanhedrin. There are many people that would say, well it was only the religious authorities that were against Christ, that that were coming against him. But we see here just general people who are passing by, those who pass by in the streets, Here's another crucifixion, another day like any other. But men and women wagging their heads, mocking God, so to speak, treating him with contempt, treating him in a a blasphemous way, treating Christ in a way which is different to that which he is. We speak about blasphemy, it's not just taking God's name in vain, It's it's when we treat God in a different way to that which he is, when we blaspheme his name, we dishonor his name being casual about the God who gives us life, treating his name in a contemptible way. Notice they were jumping on the lies. Do you remember a few weeks ago when they brought the accusations to Jesus and the different witness accounts, they, wouldn't, they couldn't match up? There were, some of them were saying, oh yeah, he said he's going to destroy the temple. And they were trying to pin some kind of terrorist claim upon him, so to speak. But notice here, these individuals that walk past, they're jumping on the narrative. Ah, you who say, you who, who is going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, they're, they're jumping on the narrative of the, of the accusations that are being levelled at Jesus Christ. Using these kind of parrot arguments almost. Mocking him. And we see that today as well, don't we? We see men and women use arguments that are just around in culture. We, 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 hear, we hear these kind of things all the time. Oh, Jesus was just a good man. He was just a, he's just a healing prophet. Uh, Jesus didn't really die on a cross. It was someone else who died in his place. And all these kind of parrot, illogical parrot arguments that men use in order to suppress and to add to the blasphemy uh, towards the Saviour. So we see the indifference of man. We see the blasphemy of man. We see, the, we see also the testers and the tempters. Open mockery, verse 30 to 32. Save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests, also mocking among themselves, and the scribes said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let let this Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see it and believe. A mockery, firstly, that's done that's not done in ignorance. It's not an ignorant mockery. Notice here how they say, he saved others, himself he cannot save. See, these guys, these folks that were mocking Christ, they knew something of his saving, his ministry. He saved others. They had been watching him in the past. They'd been watching these miracles that he'd done. They'd been watching him uh, 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 feeding thousands. They'd been watching him forgive the sins of paralytic men paralyzed individuals they've been watching Jesus saving other people so this mockery it wasn't done in ignorance towards God they weren't ignorant of his miraculous power they weren't ignorant of his saving power they weren't ignorant of the authority of his preaching but they hated it their hearts had become so hardened 
that they were mocking him and they were even mocking the saving work that he had uh, shown before their eyes. They were even mocking the mighty works of God uh, which Jesus had been involved with in his ministry. And it was a mockery that was not only uh, uh, done uh, um, without ignorance, but it was a mockery which involved temptation. Let him now descend. Descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. This was a, make no bones about it, this mockery was a last ditch attempt from Satan to, uh, to tempt Christ in, in, in not going through with this work of Calvary's cross. Satan loves to tempt in the midst of mockery. He loves to do this. He loves to tempt people in the midst of mockery. Some of you young people, don't be tempted to believe the lies of this culture around you. You know, when the world mocks you for identifying as a Christian, when the world brings mockery to you, don't be tempted to walk in a different way. Don't be tempted to walk in the course of this world just because the world mocks Christ. Maybe even some of us as adults. You know, sometimes there's pressures that are put on us. Oh, but if I tell someone I was at church yesterday, what are they going to say? What are they going to think of me? And we're tempted to deny Christ. We're tempted to go and, and to walk in a sinful way because of the mockery of the world around us. These individuals were mocking Christ. They're saying, oh, if you are the Christ, come down from the cross. That, that, mockery, that mockery involved a temptation, a satanic temptation, and, an, and a final attempt of Satan to subvert the plans and the purposes of Christ. There's many things, many different uh, aspects of this life that we may walk through. What, you don't believe evolution? You don't believe the science that says you come from a, an evolved uh, piece of bacteria? You don't believe that? We live in a world today where you're mocked if you hold to God being the creator. Don't be tempted to fold to uh, uh, unbiblical, sinful philosophies of men. Don't be tempted to fold to sin and to be tempted out of the way of truth and righteousness just because of what men may think or the mockery that surrounds uh, uh, the, the Christian. It was a mockery that was in, uh, contemptible. What do I mean by that? Well, verse 35, it says, look, he's calling for Elijah. He's calling for Elijah now. Christ is saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, and somehow they've mistaken this. They've mistaken what he's saying here uh, for him being the one who's calling out to, uh, for Elijah. They said, let's see if Elijah will come and take him down. Treating God as a spectacle. One who's at our beck and call. Notice here they, they go to him with a sponge full of sour wine put it on a reed and they offered it to him to drink saying leave him alone let us see if Elijah will come and take it down take him down now at first you could look at that and think oh they're, they're being kind but actually what they were trying to do here they were trying to resuscitate him in a sense they're trying to revive his his consciousness in a way he's on the cross they're giving him this wine let's keep him alive so we can see if Elijah's going to come and take him off this cross this was a mockery of deep contempt it was a very uh, insidious uh, um, situation that they, were, that they were mocking God here, treating him as a spectacle, treating God as if someone, someone who's at their beck and call. Let's just test God. Let's manipulate God. Let's just see uh, what's going to happen here. And we see men and women all the time bringing temptation or testing God in that kind of way, uh, testing him. Oh, well, God never does anything for me. Let's see if he's going to do anything for me tomorrow. Let's see if he's going to help me out this week. I've got, a big, I've got something big going on this week. Let's see if God's going to do anything for me. And you, see, you hear this kind of attitude all the time, men and women testing the God of Scripture. And then finally, just in this, this first D, this depravity that we see here, we see a depravity that is deeply rooted in men. A, depra a depravity that is deeply rooted in men. Verse 32b says, Even those who were crucified with him, even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now we know about the two 
thieves, the two crim criminals either side of Christ. We know about the, the one who came to his senses, was granted repentance. He, uh, he, he, he believed on the Lord. He, he, he recognized his own guilt. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. But you know, there was another, another criminal who rejected Christ. He, he, he continued to revile Christ. I mean, when you think, when you meditate upon that, the depth of that reality, the depth of the sinfulness of human hearts, it's astounding to think that here is a man, this, this criminal who rejected Christ, He's dying under the weight of his own body weight. His, his own body weight, he's trying to get his, his breath. He's dying of asphyxiation. He's breathing his last breaths and he still finds the breath and the, and the, the senses to, to muster up insults and curses against the Creator, against Christ. This really shows us the, the level of depravity of human nature. the level of mankind's grit and determination to hold on to their sin, to kick against their God. The core problem of man is not an outward issue. It's not an outward external need of transformation. It's an inward, uh, it's an inward issue of the heart. It's the heart that needs to be transformed. The Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. The heart is, is a, in a spiritual sense, a heart of stone that needs to be changed. And men and women, unless God changes them, unless they come to Christ and they're regenerated, they're, unless they're born again of the Spirit of God, they will absolutely go to hell, gritting their teeth and clenching their fists in rebellion towards God. You know, in Matthew 13, when it speaks about the tares and the wheat and the tares being gathered and burned in the fire. So it is at the end of this age when the Son of Man sends out his angels and gathers all those who practice lawlessness and casts them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's a real picture there. Now on one hand you see this picture of the gnashing of teeth of pain. I don't know if you've ever seen someone who's been in extreme pain like broken limbs or anything and there's a grinding of the teeth sometimes. But also you see this picture here of a, a condition of anger, a, a grinding of teeth, a gnashing of teeth against God. And this is the picture of the damned for all eternity, clenching their fists, refusing to come to God. This thief who's dying on the cross, he had an opportunity with his fellow criminal to cry unto the Lord, to believe on the Lord, and yet he went to his death with gritted teeth, cursing the very Saviour who's dying on the cross next to him. Mankind at their very core is a depraved creature. We don't, we, it's not an outward moral issue. It's an inward spiritual issue. Mankind needs to be changed inwardly. And only God can do that. So we think of the depravity of the crucifixion. Let's think of it for a moment of the darkness of his crucifixion, the darkness, verses 33 to 34. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So we see from 12 midday until three o'clock, we see a picture of darkness over the whole, darkness over the whole land. Now this darkness here, it's not just referring to some cloud cover. You know, if we looked out the window today and the clouds start coming over and it gets a bit dark and we've, we've all experienced that. No, this is a darkness that had a spiritual connotation attached to it. This was a darkness that could be felt tangibly. Not just talking about a bit of cloud cover. Now when we see in scripture, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, God is often referred to as the God of light. Not yet. God is often referred to as the God of light. Um, he's the one who dwells in, in, in unapproachable light, 1 Timothy 6. He's the God of light, 1 John, uh, John 1. And in him there is no darkness at all. We know about Jesus being the express 
this reality of the light of the world that came into the darkness. But you know, darkness has a real spiritual connotation to it. Men loved darkness rather than light, John chapter 3. Anyone who follows Christ shall not walk in darkness. Rome, uh, John chapter 8, Romans chapter 13, that we're called to cast off the works of darkness. So there's this picture of spiritual darkness. It's an expression of sin. It's an expression and a, and a, pic- a picture of all that is opposed to God's holy nature. God is light, therefore everything that is contrary to the nature of God is dark in a spiritual sense. It's a, it's a spiritually dark reality. Everything that is unlike God, if I could put it like that, everything that is godless is spiritual darkness. We think of the sins through, of all the men in all the world throughout the corridor of the history of the ages. All the sins that have been, that have been uh, uh, godless, so to speak. Jesus took the sins of his people upon that cross. And we see this darkness fall over the land. This picture of the spiritual darkness falling as Christ is receiving the judgment uh, for the sins of his people upon that cross. And you know, sometimes we think about Jesus paying for our sin, and rightly so. We should think about that often, frequently. But when we sometimes think about it, we think about, oh, I told, when I told, that, I told that lie the other day, or I treated someone wrong the other day, I, I said something I shouldn't... Well, we, we kind of think about these sins that we've done, and we think about how he's paid for those sins, and that is true. That is very real and proper, and, 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 a, and a, a real reality of the cross. But you know, sin is more than just us telling lies or us being mean to one another it's more than just us thinking lustful thoughts or being covetous sin is the things that we don't do sin is the things that when we don't act like God when we're when we're when we're not doing what God has called us to do we don't just sin by the the sins that we commit but we sin by the things that we omit the things that we don't do that we should and Christ as he hung on that cross The darkness of those sins of omission of all his people fell upon him. And it covered the land. There was a picture there of this great darkness overshadowing the land. An expression of the sin of his people being placed upon him as Christ was made an offering for sin. And we need to be careful here when we talk about Jesus becoming sin. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, his soul was made an offering for sin. 2 Corinthians 5 speaks about he who knew no sin was made to be sin. We need to be very careful. He didn't in any way become a sinner. He didn't become corrupted or defiled in nature in any way. But he was treated as the guilty one in place of those who were guilty so that we may be treated innocent. Jesus didn't become twisted or defiled. He didn't become a sinner. He, he was made to be the sin bearer. This darkness is a picture not only of the expression of sin that fell upon him, but also it's an expression of separation. It's a picture of separation. Sin has brought, has brought separation between man and God from the very first parents, Adam and Eve. They sinned against God. There was separation that was brought in. Remember, God was, they were hiding from him. He was looking for them. He asked the question, where are you? And we know that when the curse had been pronounced, he drove them. It says in Genesis 3.24 that God drove out man from the garden. And he placed a cherub in the, at the east of the garden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. You see, Adam's sin, the sin of Adam brought separation between man and God. And Christ's atonement on the cross has brought, has brought reconciliation back between man and God. Now this separation that we speak about, when we talk about the separation between God and man, outside of being born again of the Spirit of God, that separation is eternal. It's an eternal separation. Those who continue in sin and die in sin will be eternally separated from God. We see this separation symbolized by by darkness in the scripture not just here in our text today we think about the remember the man who tried to get into the wedding feast in Matthew 22 and and the king came 
and said, bind him, yet he didn't have the clothes, the robes that were the righteous robes, he didn't have the right uh, clothing. And there's a picture there of the unconverted soul. It says, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. You see darkness being this picture, this symbolic picture of separation from God. The second Peter, uh, chapter 2, verse 17, dealing with false teachers. It says, these are clouds carried by the tempests for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness for, forever. Darkness forever. We think about the, uh, even the, the angelic realm in Second Peter t- chapter 2. It says, for, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness. So you see this picture here uh, of being cast into eternal darkness. This is the, 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 this is the end result to all those that are in rebellion towards God, of all those human beings, millions and millions of human beings, many of which will be cast into eternal darkness, this complete and and utter eternal separation from God. Now when we think about this separation, it's important for us to recognise, just as a side note really, that it's not that people in outer darkness of hell will be away from God's presence. What do I mean by that? God is omnipresent. He's, he's everywhere. Um, Psalm 139 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, uh, behold, you are there. Now, some people uh, believe the word for hell there is referring to the underworld, the place of the dead, rather than the, uh, the lake of fire and the uh, and outer darkness, so to speak. But we see in Scripture there is a reality of God's omnipresent um, nature. We see, we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, speaking of men and women who will be punished with everlasting destru- destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. So there's a sense in which there will be from his presence. However, the word for presence there that Paul uses in 2 Thessalonians is really more commonly referring to a person's face being being before them uh, or an outward appearance, so to speak. So it's more to do with the face of someone's presence. It's a Greek word called prosopon, if you you wanted to know that. It's It's from the Greek prosopon. Whereas in Revelation 14, it speaks about the wrath Those who take the mark of the beast will be uh, drink from the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out in full strength into the cup of indignation. Those will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. Now this word here that the Apostle John uses is a different word for presence. Uh, It comes from the Greek word enopion, which is more of a spatial word. It's suggesting proximity and literal measurable distances. So what, what this means here is that in the Bible when it talks about the, 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 the outer darkness, the separation that, that the damned are going to have from God, sometimes it says that they will be cast away from God's presence in Scripture. And what that's referring to is the presence of his favour, the presence of his blessing, the presence of his goodness, as opposed to the presence of his very being. Because God will be, his presence will be with the damned in hell. It says that the smoke of their torment will ascend forever and ever in the presence of the Lamb and his holy angels. There isn't a place where God is not, but his goodness will be removed from those who are in hell. His favour, his blessings will be removed from those who are in hell. And all they will know of God is God's holy and righteous manifest wrath against sinners for their sin against him. Uh, who have sinned against him. We, 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 I guess as a bit of a side note, you know, we see areas in the scripture where, we, where it talks about drawing, uh, James chapter 4, for example, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. What, what is that? Is that like a, like a spatial thing? You know, if we come into church in the morning and we draw near to somebody, that's a spatial, we're moving into their space, their proximity. But the idea there in James 4 is this idea of the presence of God's favour. And we know that as Christians, don't we? As you, as you draw near to him, 
You experience his favour, you experience his blessing in a deeper way, his nearness, his, his very presence with you. And we can also grieve the Spirit of God as well. Sometimes, maybe some of you in here have known that, where you purposefully sinned, and you know there's been something of a withdrawal. There's been something of a, not that he leaves us or forsakes us as, as his people, but there's something of a difference with regards to the presence of God uh, in, your, in your life. Now you may, so we ask the question, why, why are you mentioning all this? Peter, with regards to God's presence and the separation of God. Well, we see that, going back to our text, we see Christ in his final moments of death hanging in the blackness of darkness, taking upon himself the sins of his people and being forsaken by his God. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus here quoting from Psalm 22. We see his life as a fulfillment of scripture from start to finish. Even his dying breaths now, we see the scriptures being fulfilled. We see uh, this messianic prophetic language in the Old Testament being, being uh, 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 fulfilled here in Christ as he cries out this Psalm 22. But he wasn't just quoting Psalms to be quaint uh, in any way. He wasn't, um, he wasn't just trying to fulfill messianic prophecy in a general sense. But what we see here, and it, neither was this a question when he's asking God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He wasn't somehow questioning in an unaware sense of what was taking place here on the cross. But what we see here in this question was an outward expression of Christ from an inward cry, the depths of his very, the core of his very being, coming from a place of deep, of deep anguish of soul, that he had been forsaken by the Father. When we speak of this forsakenness or this separation of between Christ and the Father, we're not saying that, we're not saying that in any way there wasn't any damage done to the Trinity. He didn't become any less than what he was. Christ was no, he was no less or more the Son of God than he had ever been in eternity past. He wasn't in any way stripped of his deity. He wasn't stripped of the substance and his, and his being as the second person of the Trinity. This co-equal and co-eternal nature as fully God. It wasn't lacking in any way. He didn't become any less. There wasn't any kind of fragmentation or split or breakdown within the triune nature of God. His deity wasn't diminished or cancelled in any sort. Christ always has been and always will be the beloved Son of God. And even at this point as he's hanging upon the, the cross, he didn't become any less loved by God. The Father didn't love him any less, so to speak. This eternally existent love between the Father and the Son, it wasn't broken down in any way. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 10, 17, he says, for this, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life. It's for this reason. Me laying down my life is the reason the Father loves me, that I may take it up again. No, Christ wasn't, he wasn't fractured from the Godhead, he wasn't loved any less, but there was a, on this cross... Christ was forsaken from the favour and the blessing that he had always known from his Father as God. This blessing and this favour that Christ, the, the Son of God, had always had with his Father. At this point, the Father's face was turned from him and his righteous and holy wrath and judgment was poured out upon him in our place. This eternally existent blessedness and favour that Christ had within which the Son had, had eternally dwelt. There had never been a moment when he had been without this blessed favour of his Father. Dwelling in the bosom of his Father, always knowing his presence before him, his face before him in a pleasing way. As the infinitely perfect Son of God was now forsaken as the Father's face was turned away and the full force of his wrath was poured out upon his Son. 
this idea of being forsaken. The Greek word here is the idea of being abandoned, being left behind, being deserted. When something is abandoned in the desert, it's just left and gone. Utterly forsaken. That's the word that Christ uses here. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this forsakenness was something... I mean, this is mind-blowing when you think about it. This forsakenness was something that was pleasing to the Father. It says in Isaiah 53, it pleased the Lord, Yahweh, to bruise his only Son. Think about how much you were loved by God, folks. Saints of Jesus Christ, think about how much the Father... When we sing about how deep the Father's love for us, think about what that means. How, much the, the fa- how deep the Father's love must be for us as it pleased him to forsake his only son in our place. That's mind-blowing when you think about it. A pleasing aroma, this sacrifice that was taken. We see the darkness of this separation. We see the darkness of judgment. Christ took the judgment that you and I deserve. Judgment fell upon the righteous one in the place of the guilty. In Mo, you know in the, the, Mo, the account in, of Exodus where Moses led the people out of um, Egypt, the ninth plague, where darkness, the, the, a darkness that could be felt came upon the whole land for three days. It was three hour, we have this three hour period on the cross, three days in the Old Testament. <clears throat> We see that in Exodus chapter 10. Moses stretching out his hand towards heaven and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt. Three days. We see this picture of judgment being served as Christ hung upon the cross and the darkness of God's judgment fell upon his son so that we may go free as the true people of God. The darkness of God's judgment brought about death. He was here at Golgotha, the place of the skull. Even the... I mean, that, you can go there today. There are people, historians, that believe they found the area of the exact place where it was. You see this, uh, the, this kind of picture of a skull that's hewn into the rock face. Even the area itself represented death. This saviour who laid down his life for his people. Now, it's a, uh, just as a side note, it's important for us to realise Jesus he didn't die spiritually. So you'll hear arguments sometimes, well, it, can God die So how does he die on the cross? But we know that there was a physical death that Jesus took. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus had no sin of his own, but he died as the punishment. He died under the weight of the sin of those that he was bearing in their place. The Bible tells us, through Adam's sin... Romans 5.12, therefore just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. That's why men die, that's why humans die is because of the sin of mankind. But Romans 5 goes on and it says resulting in condemnation even so one, by one man's righteous act the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. So through the sin of Adam, death came to all men, and through the death of Christ, justification came to all those who would believe. It was a death that represented judgment upon him. And we know that death couldn't hold him. He rose from the grave three days later. I've asked this question before, you know, what what happens to a person who dies with no sin? And that's only ever happened once. Well, death doesn't hold him. He he was raised to life. He rose from the dead. He dealt with our penalty. He died under the judgment that we deserve. He dealt with the justice of God. The justice of God was poured upon him. And then he rose to life because he had no sin of his own. Death could not hold him. The grave had no hold over him. It was a judgment that was purposeful. It was completed purposefully. In John 19, it wasn't in our text today, John 19 says that his final cry is, one of his final cries, it is finished. To tell us die, it is accomplished. There was a purpose behind the sacrificial death of Jesus. 
Now, hopefully, you, hopefully you, you recognize that and that you understand that. There are many people in the world today that somehow think that it was either you know, you know, something that was coincidental, he wasn't aware that he was going to go to the cross or it wasn't in his plan, or maybe that it was a, back, a backup plan. Adam and Eve sinned, so I better go and do this work of the cross now. Well, no, the Bible says he was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. The whole of this world exists. The reason this world exists is for Christ to come and to go to that sacrificial death of the cross, that he would be glorified for all eternity in, this, in his saints, in those who are his. It was a work that was satisfactory. We, it is finished. We can't add to it. We can't take away from it. We're not saved by any other way. We're not saved by our, by our own deeds. We're not saved by our religious expressions, our, our, our traditions. We're not saved by something we do or something we don't do. We're saved by something that he has done on our behalf. And that is the distinct difference. I share about this a lot. It's the distinct difference between biblical Christianity and all the world's self-righteous religious systems that are out there today. Even much of what goes on in the name of Christianity is also encompassed in that group. He was in control. You know, I said earlier about the Father, when G Jesus said in John 10, 17 to 18, he said, therefore the Father loves me because I lay my life down that I may take it again. He's, he goes on to say, no one takes it from me. No one took Jesus' life from him, but I lay it down myself. And I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. It was purposeful. Do you know in verse 23 of our text, when they mixed uh, wine with uh, myrrh, they mixed wine with myrrh and they wanted to give it him to drink. In fact, let's just look at it. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. This was a primitive uh, anesthetic. Take this myrrh, take this wine, that's what they used to do to, to dull the pain. And Jesus didn't take it because he knew that this, this was what he was, had to do. He knew that he had to go through this. He didn't need men to try and comfort him in any way. He wasn't depending upon the disciples to back him up as he's on, hanging on the cross. He wasn't depending on the comfort of men. But he knew that he was in the Father's will. And he knew that this was the purposeful, uh, completed work that he had been given to do. Just one more point on, on, on darkness, and I'll just move on if, if I may. Um, we see here in this darkness that descends in these three hours, we see here something of a, of a, of a picture of mystery. Darkness can conceal things, can't it? You can't see, you can't fully see what's going on. You can't fully see what's taking place. You know, when it comes to the atonement, there's a sense in which it's so simple that even a child can understand. Some, you know, I share with Bethany and Samuel, we talk about the substitutionary work of Jesus. It's so simple that a child can understand, but there are mysteries in the substitutionary work of Jesus that are infinite in nature. When we think about the eternal punishment that he took in the place of his people, there are, there are things within the atonement that are, that are a mystery and that we will be tracking down for all eternity to come. How can one man take the sins of so many people? How can one man in, in a period of time take an eternal, infinite penalty upon himself on the cross? See, it was on the cross where he took that judgment. These are questions. They have much to do with, with the capacity of Christ, with the fact that he is not just a mere man, but that he's God in the flesh. But the point I'm trying to make in here is that there are many mysteries in the gospel. We can, we, in some ways, we'll never fully fathom the infinite nature of, what, of the penalty that was paid, of the price that Christ took in our place, but we must strive to keep our eyes on this reality. We must strive to realize that he's the one who stood in our place and took our punishment, so to speak. So, we've spoken about the darkness of separation, the darkness of judgment, we've spoken about the depravity. Let's just consider now the direct access that is now open. 
we see immediately as Christ breathed his last breath, what's the first thing that then happens? We see the curtain being torn in two. Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Verse 38, then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. From top to bottom. The veil of the temple. This is an 80 foot we're not talking here, you see these curtains against the windows, we're not talking here about a little curtain, this is an 80 foot high, about 20, uh, uh, 20, 24 metres, inches thick in width, and it was torn from top to bottom. This was a work that God had done. And it was a picture of, God, uh, uh, a picture of the reality of God allowing access to his people. Access which is now open to his people through his sacrifice. It's only because of this work of Christ that anyone can, can ever have or ever has had or ever will have access to God. The only reason that Abraham can have access to God is through this work of Christ, this sacrificial work of Christ. The only reason that Moses can have access to God is through the sacrificial work of Christ. The only reason that saints in the future maybe many more years to come, can have access to God is through the sacrificial work of Christ. Prior to this atoning work, we see the old covenant processes, the institutions, which all pointed towards this coming Messiah and his work. We see the ceremonial laws which were fulfilled in Christ, these sacrificial types and shadows that all pointed to Christ's final in complete sacrifice. Hebrew, Hebrews 10, 3 to 7 <clears throat> says, But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. See, it was only through the blood of Christ passing through the, that veil, that high priest, as Hebrews chapter 9 tells us, going and entering into the most holy place with his own blood once and for all. And that's what Jesus did. No more sacrifices necessary. This great high priest Jesus has entered the holy of holies with his own blood and he's provided that ultimate sacrifice in the place of his people. And we can now come to God through this great high priest, our elder brother, Jesus Christ. We can... This, this veil that was torn, this curtain temple being torn, is a picture of mankind being allowed access into his presence. The only reason we as, as, as believers can come to God today, we can worship together around his throne of grace, we can seek him in prayer today, is because this sacrificial work of Christ, this temple curtain that's been torn in two, we see this picture of God opening the way of salvation to all the world. I mean, in the Old Testament, think about how many, how many Gentiles do we see saved in the Old Testament? You've got like, how many we've got? We've got maybe Jeth Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. We've got Ruth. Any more? Can anyone think of any more? Rahab. We've got Naaman, the Syrian, the Syrian general. Maybe Darius, king of Persia. Maybe Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe the Ninevites of Jonah's ministry. You know, you can, really, you can count really on one hand the amount of Gentile believers in the Old Testament. But after the, cru after the crucifixion, after the, the atoning work of Christ, all of a sudden, this way, this access that mankind has with God is opened up. Who's the first, who's the, the very next verse? We see the temple curtain torn in two, verse 38. The very next verse, 39. So when the centurion, this is a Roman Gentile, when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that, he cried out, like, saw that he cried out like this he, and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. That wasn't a coincidence that here you have this Gentile man believing upon Christ in the very next verse to this temple uh, 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 curtain being torn in two. We see access 
the Gentile world, the gospel going out to all men from tri every tribe and, and tongue, every nation. Christ is the one who's broken down that wall of separation so as to create in himself one new man from the two, Ephesians chapter 2. It expresses this curtain being torn shows that man has now access with God, but it also shows that God has come out to man. That God has come to us. We see, we see the fulfilment of this reality at, at Pentecost. As God the Holy Spirit is poured out upon his church in a, in a new way, in a sense. Christ having ascended victorious, being enthroned in heaven at his coronation. And now the Spirit now proceeding from Christ and the Father. This anointing of every believer. That every believer will have this obligation and this gift of being endowed with the Spirit of God from on high. These roles for the believer of prophet, priest and king. A chosen people. As 1 Peter 2 verse 9 says, you are a chosen generation. If you're in here today and you're a Christian, this applies to you. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. His own special people that you... And this is the reason that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. And this, this access was God's doing. It was God's doing. Notice how, the, notice how the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom. It wasn't torn from the bottom up. It wasn't man coming in and ripping it up. God came and ripped it from the top down. He's the one who instigated this access for his people. And then finally, just very quickly... We've looked at the direct access. We've looked at the darkness of judgment, the darkness of separation. We've looked at the depravity of man. Now finally, the need of devotion, the response of devotion. This centurion in verse 39, he saw Christ. He looked to Christ. And in a sense, this, was the, this is the eye of faith that is needed. He saw through the eyes of faith as Jesus breathed his last in death. You see, if there was ever a time when Jesus didn't look like the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, it's as he's hanging on a cross. It, it's a picture of weakness in the, in the eyes of the world. It's a picture of failure. It's a picture of foolishness, as it tells us in Corinthians. It's a foolish thing. The cross is a foolish thing. Here's a dead, a dead Jewish man who's now hanging upon a cross. But as this centurion beholds the glory of Christ through the eye of faith, he sees... He sees something of the beauty. He sees something of the glory of what took place upon that cross. And we need to be a people who behold Christ for who he is. You know, you ask the world out there, who's Jesus to you? Oh, he's just some, he's just some dead religious guy. He just died on a cross. What, what, what bearing is that on me? But when you have an encounter with him, when you see and you look to Christ through the eye of faith, as that other, the other thief did, there was one thief who rejected him unto death, and there was the thief who believed. He, he, he saw his guilt. He saw the beauty and the splendor of Christ. And notice here what the centurion says. He says, truly, this was the Son of God. Truly. You see, we need to come to God in a true sense. He saw him not only through the eye of faith, but he saw him truly for who he is, for who he truly is. There's many different ideas out there about who God is, about who Jesus is, but we need to come to him in a true way. We need to come to him in his word and, and, and experience the manifest presence of Christ as we, as we see the gospel in the word of God and the truth of God, the spirit of truth works in our hearts to show us Christ in a true way as we learn things about his, the, uh, even as we've been talking this morning, the nature of the, of the sacrifice of Calvary, as we learn things about his preeminent uh, nature, how he's seated on the throne and reigning from heaven even today, we learn in truth and we come to him in spirit and in truth. And we must be a people, just to close now, not only are we devoted to Christ by the eye of faith, not only are we devoted to him in a truthful way, but may we be a people that are, that are devoted to him as we take up our cross 
and come after him. Now I know this is kind of jumping back in our text a little bit, but we see this picture of Simon, Simon the Cyrenian. He's standing by, he's, he's there, and, he's, and he's, he's asked or he's compelled, the Bible tells us, that they compelled him to take up Jesus' cross and to carry his cross for him. And that's a picture really of the Christian life. We're called to take up our cross and to come after Christ. And this idea that you can believe in Jesus and not take up your cross, it's opposed to the scriptures, it's antithetical to the Christian worldview. To be born again is to be changed. This idea of easy believism, like, yeah, I can believe Jesus is my saviour and I'm just going to live how I want to live, I'm going to live like the world, there's no desire for purity, for holiness, for righteousness. No desire to search out the scriptures to see the will of God for my life and to be obedient to his will. No desire to take up our cross daily and to come after him. That's a faith that cannot save. James says, doesn't he, faith without works is dead. And true evidence that a person's been changed inwardly is that there's something of a taking of their cross, denying themselves and coming after him following him. Jesus said in Mark 8 and maybe I'll finish with this verse whoever, desi whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it may we be a people that have seen, like this centurion we've seen the beauty of the cross we've spoken about the the, 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 the forsakenness of Christ, the, judge, the judgment of Christ that fell upon him. We've spoken about the depravity of man this morning. We've spoken about the access that this gives us into his presence. May we be a people that would be devoted to him, like this centurion who called out these words, truly this was the Son of God. May we know God's saving power in our own lives. Maybe some of you young folk, if you've not been saved by God, I'd encourage you to come to Christ, to get your eyes upon him, to keep your eyes on him. And even, us, even those in here that are, more, uh, that are saved and, and, are, and are walking with the Lord, you know, we've got to keep our eyes upon him. The motivation for the Christian life is found in who Christ is and what he's done for us at the cross. So just a few thoughts for us there in consideration to the crucifixion. Um, may the Lord be pleased to bless that. Uh, to our hearts this morning. Let's pray, shall we? Let's pray.